guys, Samantha from Dressy Math Tutorials here and today I'm going to be showing you how to make my mica necklace. Now this time we are going to be using slightly different colours. I'm going with a more purple and reddish brown look. So I'll just bring over the colours for you to see. Just trying to get them all in the shot at the same time. So these are the colours that we are going to be using today. So you can see we've got a nice range of browns and we've got a nice range of purples. Now, I showed the colour recipes at the beginning of the video. So this is number one for the purples, number two for the purples and number three for the purples. And then this is number one for the browns, number two for the browns and number three for the browns. So these are the ones that we are going to be using. So I'll just show off the purples first. And now with mica shifts, it's basically just the same as any mica shift, except that this time we're going to be using um, coloured clays. They have been, they have Kato concentrates included in them. So the way the Kato concentrates work is basically they are a higher concentration of colour than normal clay colours. So here's what they look like. They look pretty much the same but you can see that the colour over here is a lot darker than the normal colours that you would get. And also another thing that you will notice with them is that they are a lot harder. Now a small amount of this can colour an entire block of white clay. So the, these are very very strong as far as colour concentration goes which is basically what they're for. So what you use them for with the mica shifts is you would take your pearl white clay and your translucent clay and you'd mix equal parts of those together and then you would take your concentrate and you'd only have to add a very little amount to get a nice strong colour like this. And if you go back and have a look at the colour recipes I'm sure that you'll see that there's very little concentrate to actual clay and that's what the great thing is about it because the more colour you add to your mica clay, the, le the more spaced out your mica particles are and so the weaker your mica shift will be. So what these achieve um, is that they will give you a really strong colour by, but you only have to mix in a small amount and so you get a higher mica concentration than if you used normal coloured clay. So that's what the concentrates are for. Now you can use coloured clay, you don't, you, you can use normal clay like the Prima, you don't have to use concentrates as they can be a little fiddly to work with because um, they, they're, they're very brittle. But I find that the concentrates give a really nice colour, you can mix any colour you want and you can get a stronger colour as you want. So we're going to be working with this one and this is the, perp the number one purple. And we are going to be using some stamps today. So I'll just bring over the stamp. And what I've got over here are some... Oh, these are some scrapbooking stamps. They're the little acrylic ones. So I'll just get out some. Just give me a second. Here's what they are. And the one that we're going to be using today is this peacock one. So I like these ones because they're just as good as any um, polymer clay stamp and they're different. You can get them really cheap on eBay and they work really nicely for mic shifts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go bring over my spray bottle. Okay, so here's my water. And it's just a normal spray bottle with water. And what we're going to do is we're going to take our stamp and stick it to our tile. And now these stamps release their grip on the polymer clay really well. So I'm just going to spray it lightly. I don't want a lot of water on it because the clay can very easily lift out. Then I'll lay the clay over the top and 
spray the top of the clay to prevent it sticking to our fingers. Now what we need to do, so we need to start from one end of the stamp and work our way up. From one end to the other. And what this does is it pushes out all the air and excess water that might be in there. And you need to press quite hot. So the clay that I'm using is Kato, as I find that it's the best clay for a mica shift because it's got very high mica concentration. Primo works pretty well, but I just like Kato the best. And that's just a personal preference. So I'm almost done. Okay, so I finished impressing the clay into the stamp. And you want to take a while with this because these have quite a deep texture usually. And so just make sure to go over and make sure that you've press, pressed it in properly. Then I'm just going to dry the top and around the edges and lift it off slowly. And that's what we have. Now, I'm just going to quickly dry my tile because you don't want any water in the area because you want your, your um, clay to stick to your tile while you're doing your mic shift. So just gently pat down your clay onto your tile and I'm just going to trim away any excess that I don't need because we want a lot of this clay left because we are going to do a few more textures with this clay. We, we want one stamped texture per clay and then we want one texture done with some cutters and then we also want one done with tools like this and this. So I'll show you that in a minute but for the moment we'll focus on this one. So just make sure to pat it down onto your tile to make sure that it's not moving around. And if it is moving around, like over there, you're going to have to go back over and make sure that you've dried it properly. Because you don't want this stuff moving around while you're doing your mic shift. Okay. So that's okay. Now you'll take your flexible tissue blade and I'm going to hold it in the middle. You don't want to be holding it on the ends like this. You want to hold it in the middle to prevent gouging and things like that. And keep your hands resting on your work surface as you slowly go over the surface of your clay. And now go slow with this. It's important to go slowly because the slower you go, the more precise you are and the steadier your hand will be. And therefore the less mistakes you'll make and then the greater your mic shift will be. And I always like to go shallow at first, and if I miss any areas, I can always just go back and fix that. But if I go too deep, I can't fix that. So I always say go shallow and then come back and fix the areas that you don't like. You can't go back and fix areas where you've gone too deep. So I could be here and here, I've missed a few areas. So I'll go over there, very shallow. make sure that I got the entire bit. So it's important to try and get a nice flat mic shift and then roll. Just like that. Okay. And I missed a little area over here. Now we're not going to use all of this of course because we need some of this for our other mic shifts. So I'm just going to trim away the edges. Like that. And then we can clean up all of this, these bits and bobs all over the place because you don't want those hanging around 
while well, you're flattening your piece because otherwise they can accidentally go and get onto your piece and mess up your mica shift. So just make sure to clean up all these little bits before you proceed. Otherwise you might have to start again. Okay, I'll just pop that to the side. And then I'll bring over my acrylic rod. And I'll very slowly start to flatten the piece. And I like to go in a circular motion while I roll. I don't like to go in one direction. This helps the pattern stay. Um, it helps it not get distorted. Now you don't want to go too hard with the roller because it will flatten out your mica particles and can it can just dull your image. So just make sure that you only roll as much as you need to. You don't want to do more than that. Okay. So I'll just pick this up. And I'll bring it up for you to see. And that's what it looks like at the moment. Now, this is going to look much better once it's baked because it's got translucent in it and so the translucent will go translucent when it's once it's baked and so the depth of your mica shift will increase. So I'll put that aside and we'll use that in a little while. Now what you need to do is bring over another sheet of this colour and we'll start with the next texture. Okay, so here's the next piece that we're going to be using and we are going to be using cutters today. So I'll just bring over some of my cutters that we're going to be using and these are all from small to large. There we go. And if you're wondering, I got these off of Fire Mountain Gems and they come in a set, these ones. You also have another one. So these come in a set, but we're not going to be using the largest one. And this one I got off of Happy Things, the European website. So I got this one off of Happy Things and I got these ones off of Fine Mountain Gems. Now we're going to start with the largest one. I want to use this one. And you want to just impress it into the clay in random areas. Just like that. And what this is doing is it's um, pushing down on those mica particles and manipulating them into an image. Oops. Okay, and then when you're done with the largest one, you'll go with the smaller one. And go and fill in any gaps and maybe go and have it sit in some of the middle ones, some of the larger ones. Just have some fun and see what you can make. Now to go down all through the sizes until I reached the smallest size. Okay, so here we are done. I've put in all the circles that I want to and you can see it's in a fairly random fashion but that's exactly what I want. Now what we need to do is we need to press all of these pieces back together. So I'll bring over my tissue blade and what I like to do like to press on the edges. Don't press too hard because you don't want this curving or curling or anything like that. You just want to kind of do it in a reducing fashion but you're using your blade instead of your fingers as um, this is a little too thin for your fingers to reduce. But basically just to press all of these layers back together. So you can see already that we're getting quite far and this is how I like to reduce some canes if the cane is random. This isn't a good way to reduce canes that whoops sorry this isn't a good way to reduce canes if they have a specific image to them. But if the cane has circles like this where you don't mind if they go into an oval shape, it's a really great way to reduce a large cane and to get a more random fashion out of it. But if you're not going for a random, this is a terrible way to reduce a cane. 
But there we are, I'm reducing it down quite a bit. Then I can flip it and I can also start doing it on the other side. Now, once you've lifted it from your tile and it's not stuck down anymore, you're going to have to use your fingers to do this, which is a little harder, but it's fairly thick now, so I can do it. And that's why I like to do it with my blade first. Now, you don't want to reduce this down too far, you just want to reduce it enough that all those circles are nicely stuck together. Just like that. Okay. Then when you're done, just take your roller and very lightly roll over the top and then press it down onto your tile so that you can shave off the top. And I'll be using my flexible blade again. And I'll just take slices from the top. Just like that. Now, this will give you a completely different effect to the ones that were done using a stamp. The stamps will give you a more 3D effect, or this one will give you a more 2D effect. So the stamps, they're, they're made to give a 3D image. Cutters are more 2D, and so the image that you get from the mic shift will look different. And this is why I like um, the variation. There we are. I'm just going to cut off any excess that I don't like because we need to do one more. Um, we need to do one more texture. So I'll just bring over the previous one that we used and see if you can see the difference. Oops. I'll brighten it up so you can see better. There we are. So you can see there's quite a difference between this one and this one. They just have a different look to them. So I'll put these aside and we can get to the next texture. Okay, so now we've got our last piece and we're going to create our last texture with it. Now this time, instead of using cutters, I like to use indenting tools. So here's one of them and I got this tool and a bunch of other ones. As you can see I've got an entire drawer full of them and I got these off of Fire Mountain Gems. Again, <laughs> I get a lot of my stuff off them and I'm just going to use it to create an image in the clay. And again it's just about pushing into the clay and distorting those mic particles. Now this is a slightly random pattern. I'm not going for anything specific. you can have fun with this. You don't have to have a texture sheet to do this. There we go. And I'm almost done. We'll see how that comes out. Okay. Then again, I'm going to take my blade and condense it in on itself, just like we did before. We don't really want to use a roller to flatten this out as it will weaken the mica shift look. Okay. Just squish around the edges to get those pieces all nice together. Okay, then we'll pat it down onto the tile. And we'll bring over our flexible tissue blade. And again, shave off the excess. 
just like that. And this will again give us a little bit of a different look. Because this is not precise. The cutters will look a bit more precise because they were made with machines and so therefore they will look more precise than this. This one kind of looks like a spider web, which is the point. So those are the three textures that I am going to use with this colour. But then you've got another five colours to do. So I'll just bring up these ones. So these are the three textures that I've got out of that colour that we are going to use in our beads. But then we've got the other five colours that we need to do marker shifts with. But I'm not going to show you all of that because that will take a long time and it's quite boring I'm sure. So just experiment around. You need one stamped texture for each colour, one texture made with cutters for each colour and one texture done with indenting tools that you did by yourself for each colour. And I'll come back when I've got all of those done. Okay, so I've finished all of the mica shifts and now I'm going to just bring them over to show you. So here's the peacock one. And here's the one that we did by hand that I showed you how to do. And here's the one that was done with the circles. Now what I've done is I've gone and rolled them through the pasta machine and some of them I had to put a backing on to get them to the thicker setting on my pasta machine because you want them all to be the same thickness. Now I'm going to bring over the other mica shifts that I've done. So I'll just move these out the way. Here's one. And this was also done using those scrapbook stamps. And here's another one done with the same colour and this was done with triangular cutters instead of round. Here's another one and this one was very similar to this one except that I used a blade to make it so it's a bit more symmetrical. Okay and here's the darker purple. And that's the little dandelion one. And this again was done with some of those stamps that I showed you. Here's one that was done with cutters and these were oval cutters. And here's another mic shift done and all I did with this one was I took a yep, took my knife and I stippled it in. And then rolled it flat and that's how it came out. Put that aside. So those are the purples. Now I'm going to move on to the browns. So here's another one and you can see that was done with the scrapbooking stamps as well. And this one was done with square cutters. And this one was the, the by hand one and all I did was I took my knife, the blood side of it, and I drew lines across and then I took um, a needle tool and I poked little holes in it and then pushed it together and that's how it came out. Then here's another brown and this is a little dragonfly stamp that I've got. And then this one was done with diamond cutters and this one was done with my needle tool and I just went and dotted it around it in a spiral pattern. Then here's the last one. Got a little butterfly. Got some star cutters. And this one was more of a random one where I just took the edge of my blade and stippled really long lines all over the place so I got a random spider web sort of a pattern. So these are all the ones that we are going to be using today. And really you don't have to use the patterns that I've done, you can do whatever mica shift you want. It's really about having fun with the mica shifts. So now we have to get down to business though. We need to make cut we need to make beads out of this. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to take a teardrop cutter, like this one, and we're just going to cut out a bead. Just like that. If you get stuck in the cutter, just gently work it out. Just like that. 
and then I've got so we want to be drilling through from the thick end so it's going to be hanging on the necklace like that so I'm just going to pop this on a black backing because it needs to be a bit thicker and this was rolled through on my thicker setting excuse me if my head gets in and I'm just going to cut that out as well okay so that's our bead now I'm going to go and pop this in the oven at the recommended temperature for Kato and let me just go have a look at that quickly that is 300 Fahrenheit or 150 Celsius for Kato but if you're not working with Kato just go with the recommended temperature for your brand so I'll do all of the other mica shifts into beads like this and I'll come back to show you how to finish off the edges and how to sand and buff it okay so here are the beads now that I've cut them out so you can see we have quite a few and this is what they look like when they are raw so I just wanted to show you what they look like with, when they are raw so that when I cut to when they are baked you can see the difference that it makes when they're baked so I'll be back when they're baked okay so here are the beads now that they are finished baking and you can see that the mica shift is definitely stronger now that they're baked and that's due to the translucent we mixed in going translucent so the depth of the pattern will be a lot um, more obvious now but now what we want to do is we want to fix up the edges of our beads so if I showed you this one you can see that we have some cracking over there Oops. so we want to fix those up I'm just going to move these aside and we'll just use the one with the crack at the end and then I'll show you what we need to do. So I've got a ball of black over here. And this is Kato and I've just warmed it up in my finger so it's nice and soft and I'll just take a piece and what you do is you squish it up against the end of the bead like that. Take your finger and smear it along the edge of your bead and when you're doing this you want to apply a lot of pressure because you only want to smear enough that it will cover any cracks and cover the edge black but you don't actually want a border so if you look at it from the top like this you don't want to be able to see it if you can you need to go back and smear off more of that black so you'll go around the entire bead and if you don't have to get completely right the first time so you can see over here that I had some peeling just go back over that area and smear over again and that should cover up that peeling and so you want to go over the bead until you've got it completely covered with black so just take your time make sure you do it properly because this is what's going to give the bead a nice professional finish on the edges of your bead so now you've got this point and I like to pop a little ball at the top and then smear it down so that it joins up with the other places that I've smeared and that will cover it up and make it look nice and black and then just make sure to clear up the edges so that there's none of the crumbles on your bead and then go around your finger and what I like to do is I like to use this part of my finger and I go and I smooth the edges of my bead because you don't really want to be sanding this part of your bead excessively because this layer of black is very 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 thin and so if you sand it too much you'll sand it completely off and so you don't want to have to sand it too much so you want to make an effort a big effort of smoothing it out so that you don't have to sand it so I spend quite a while doing that so I'll just clean up over here get rid of all these bits and pieces and that is what it should look like like that so you can see the black slightly around the edges so I need to go and just smooth down a bit more to get rid of as much of that black as possible. But that's basically what it should look like. 
So just take your time and spend a little bit of time making sure that it's to your liking and you'll do that with all of your beads and we'll come back when I've finished all of them and they're ready to bake. Okay, so I've finished putting the borders on the beads as you can see so they've got a nice black border around them now and you can't tell it so it, it just makes it a lot neater right now so now what you need to do is you need to bake it for another half an hour at the recommended temperature for your clay brand and then we'll come back and I'll show you how to sand them and buff them and then we can pop some resin on them okay so here they are all finished baking and now what we need to do is sand them. Now when it comes to mica shifts especially you need to make sure that you spend a long time sanding these. The mica shift of all the techniques when it comes to polymer clay I find that mica shifts are generally the most demanding techniques when it comes to the finishing off process as the sanding and buffing and varnishing stage really make the difference between whether your mica shift looks good or great. So just make sure that you spend a good long time sanding. So the sanding papers that I'm going to be using are these little sanding cloths that I got off of Fire Mountain Gems and they go from about 400 grit to 8000 and so these are the ones that I'm going to be using. Now you need to sand the fronts, sides and backs of your bead. The sides don't worry too much about, you just want to give them a light sand to make sure that you can buff them nicely. The fronts you want to give a really good sand and the backs you want to give a really good sand. Now you can use wet dry sandpaper, that also works, um, especially for the back. But I like these sanding papers because they, they're um, easy on my hands because if you've ever sanded a lot you'll probably um, remember sanding your fingertips off every now and then and the good thing about the sanding cloths is that they don't sand off your fingertips I've sanded off my fingertips so many times when I was using wet dry sandpaper so I really like the sanding cloths so you'll just go you'll just go in a round circular motion like this and when you're sanding you want to spend a long time on the first and the last grit. The in-between grits you want to spend a fair amount of time with but your longest time, your the most of your time should be spent on the first and the last grit. And so you can see already that that's starting to give you a fairly good shine and then just make sure to sand from the top as well because sometimes your bead surface isn't even and so if you just sand downwards like this the whole time you can miss a few areas so just make sure to sand from the top as well like that and then just sand the edges and don't go nuts with it you don't want to sand off that black completely you just want to get rid of any bumps and things like that so you can give it a nice buff so just go around and give it a bit of a sand and then the back you want to give a really good sand especially with the back now when we first made the beads and we had um, we put the black layer on the black on the back you could have textured that with some sandpaper and things like that but I wanted a nice smooth back so I'll go and sand the back quite a bit for quite a long time on each of these beads so sanding is going to take you at least an hour. If it doesn't take you longer than that, then you're probably not sanding it well enough. So I'm going to go and spend the next hour or more sanding all of these beads over here from the lowest grit that I can, from the lowest grit, which is a 4,000. I wouldn't go further down in a 4,000, otherwise you can end up scratching your bead and I go up to the highest grit I possibly can which is the 8000 and even though we're putting resin on these you want to give them a really good sand because it does make a difference in the end okay so I've just finished sanding all of these and in all it took about two hours 
So you can see that to get these sanded properly and finish them off really nicely you need to take a really long time with it. And now it's important to do this with the mic shifters. Now you can see I've got a really nice glossy finish on this end. See? Also it brings out the pattern more as well so if your mic shift doesn't look as good as it could um, after you've baked it, sand, just make sure to sand it and you'll see that it just brings out the colours and it makes that pattern really really show. So sanding is one of the most important steps to getting a great mic shift. And another great way to improve the mic shift is to add resin to them and this is what we are going to do now. So I'm going to bring over the resin and we can varnish them. Okay, so now that we're finished with the beads, we can proceed with the resin. Now I'm using ice resin today, and this is what it looks like. It comes in two bottles, and this is the resin, and this is the harden. And you want to mix equal parts of each of these into a mixing cup like this one and then very slowly stir it together. Now ice resin can be very fiddly in the beginning as it's not what you would call a very forgiving resin. If you get the measurements slightly wrong you have to be meticulously accurate with your measurements because if you get it slightly off it won't cure. Now if you're afraid to use the sort of two-part resins um, Lisa Pavelka's Magic Gloss will work very well for this sort of thing and that's a one part resin but I like using ice resin as it's cheaper and I've gotten used to how it works. The key to it basically is to just make sure that you measure it correctly. And then another thing that you always have to remember is that you need to mix it thoroughly. Now you don't want to scramble it like an egg you want to slowly fold it in like you would cake batter. You want to avoid air bubbles at all costs. But you want to spend at least five minutes mixing it. You want to scrape off your stirring stick. You want to make sure that you scrape around the edges and the bottom of your mixing cup. And just make sure that it's thoroughly mixed because that's another really, another large reason for your resin not curing. So just make sure that you measure it correctly and that you and that you mix it thoroughly. And then your chances of not having cured resin will drop drastically. So just make sure you do that and I'll come back when I've got this poured out and I'll show you how to mix it. Okay, so I've mixed up about 10 mils of resin. And this is because I've got two projects I'm going to be doing today, and so I need a bit more resin. Now I'm going to be using a skewer to mix, as I find that it introduces less air bubbles than things like popsicle sticks. And all you want to do is you just want to slowly and deliberately mix in the resin. And in the beginning it will be very cloudy and it will have almost a pearlescent quality to it. And this is pretty normal, this is the two parts swirling together. And you'll know that you've mixed it correctly when this clears up to a crystal clear water-like consistency. So you want to mix until you've got rid of every single one of these striations. Not one can be left, otherwise your resin has the risk of not curing. So just take your time, scrape the edges of the cup, sometimes scrape the edges, scrape off your mixing tool and continue mixing. And don't scramble it, you just want to slowly, slowly stir and try to avoid air bubbles. You are going to get air bubbles, this is inevitable I have found. It doesn't matter how slowly you mixed and how careful you are, you're going to end up with some air bubbles. But the goal is to avoid as many as physically possible. So I can take up to five minutes doing this. Now in the meantime, while we're waiting for this to clear up, I just want to mention that temperature has 
um, a big impact on resin in a, in general. So I'm in midwinter at the moment, and so this resin is quite cold, which means that the curing process will take longer. It takes about 12 to 24 hours to cure, and in summer it can even it can take maybe even nine hours if it's really hot. And if you put it in direct sunlight, it can take less than three hours to cure. So the hotter your environment, the shorter your working time is going to be. So, but it also means that in a colder environment, you're going to have to wait for it to cure for a lot longer. So if you're living in a cold environment and you come back to your beads and they haven't cured within 12 hours, don't worry, it might be just that you're in a cold environment and it just hasn't fully cured. Leave it 24 hours, check again. If it's gloopy, then it's not going to cure, but if it's slightly, slightly sticky to the touch, leave it another 24 hours. And if it's still sticky and hasn't cured, then you haven't mixed it properly and you're going to have to start again. But it can take up to 32 hours to cure if you're house or working area is very cold. So if you want to cure it faster, popping it in the sunlight will help. But in winter you've got, you've got to be prepared to wait at least 12 hours. In summer however, if you put it in the midday sun, make sure that you're watching it the entire time because it can burn. I've burnt my beads before and it can cure within half an hour in the sun. So Temperature is a very important factor when using resins like this. So we're about mixed. As you can see, I've got a few air bubbles, but they're quite big. So if we pop these on the beads and then um, left the beads for about five minutes, maybe even one minute, um, these will float to the surface and you can blow on your bead with a straw and they will pop. And I'll show you that when we're done. So just scrape off the mixing stick and I'll go over and get the beads. Okay, so we're about ready to do the resin. And this is the curing mat that I have. And I apologize for the insanely red color. But this is the only one that I could get in a silicone form. So it's a waffle mat that I got on eBay. And it's silicon which means that the resin will release from it really easily so I'll just bring over some of the beads and yes the colors do clash but I'll just bring over a few to show you what we're gonna do and I don't want to crowd the board yet so I'll just use these ones so we'll just bring over this one and now I'll also bring over our resin and I'll just take my stick and drip the resin on. Now, when you're doing resin, you want to start with less than you need and work it onto your bead and then add more when you need more. But doing this, you will avoid problems with your resin dripping. So don't try to overdo it. If you overdo it, you'll break the surface tension and you will get drips. And that is the last thing you want. So, that one versus that one. They're the exact same color, but you can see it. this one just looks so much better. Now I'll just bring this one over. And again, you'll just drip the resin on and go slow with it. Don't add too much. Just drag it across the surface. And another thing to just keep in mind when you're doing this is to not worry too much about any air bubbles if there are any. Once you've finished working with your resin, you, you have about 40 to 45 minutes working time, longest. In summer that can be shortened to about 15 minutes if it's really hot, but generally you have about half an hour to work with this. So once your beads are finished, um, once you've finished putting the resin on them, you will have plenty of time to go back with a straw and blow across the beads to get rid of any bubbles that have risen to the surface. And I'll show you that 
in just a second once I've finished resining these ones just to show you what it looks like and here's the brown one, we'll see what this one looks like look really nice, the resin just adds that sparkle and depth to the mica shift I'd say one of the mica shifts are the best technique to use with resin the resin just enhances their look so so much There we are, you can just see that it's so much more glossy and domed and just looks wonderful. So I'm going to go and resin the rest of the teardrops. I've got quite a few more to resin and I'll come back and show you what they look like and how to get rid of the bubbles. Okay, so I finished putting the resin on all of these beads. Now what you do is you get a straw and this is, well, simple straw and all you do let me just move it out a bit for you so you go with your straw and blow lightly over the top of your bead where your resin is don't blow hard because you'll end up spraying resin everywhere and I've done that before and it's not a nice thing to do because <laughs> it makes a mess and you ruin your effect. So just blow lightly through the store over the top of your bead. And then I hope that you saw the bubbles pop. There we go. I hope that you saw that. Um, the bubbles right at the top of the resin will be the ones that pop. If you've got ones still floating in the resin, just leave it for about three minutes, come back, blow over it again, and if you've still got stuff floating in, come back in another three minutes and blow again. And do that over the course of about half an hour while it cures, and by then you should have every single one of those bubbles gone. And that's generally how I get rid of my air bubbles because no matter how hard I try, I always do get one or two. And when you're pouring it onto your beads, you'll also get a few. So it's always good to remember to use the straw to get rid of any air bubbles. So this is going to take about 24 hours to 12 hours to cure. And so I'll come back and we can do some stringing once they are finished curing. I'll see you there. Okay. So these are just about finished curing. So I can run my finger over the top of this without it sticking. It's glass-like at the moment, and that's how you know it's cured enough. So I'll just move these out the way. We had one little spill. So I'll just move these out the way and show you why I like using a silicon mat for my resin. So here's the spill and I'm just going to push on the bottom of the mat and you can see it just pops out like that and there your mat is ready to use again and this is why I like using the silicone mats because they're just really really easy to use now bring these over again you can see just how wonderfully beautiful they look with that resin now that's it's, on. it's just brought out that mica shift and given it an extra sparkle and this is what I'm saying, of all the techniques I've ever tried, I still say that mica shifts are the one that deserve the resin the most. It just enhances them so much. So we've got a whole bunch and I'll lay them out in a pattern for you in a little while. But for now, I'm going to show you how to drill them. So, we'll start with this one just move these aside. Now this is a little tricky and I like to do it after my beads are baked but instead of using an electric drill I like to use a manual hand drill and these are easily available online on eBay and today we're going to be drilling it from the round side. So I hold it in my fingers just like this and I line it up to where I want it then I press and start twisting. 
slowly to create a guide hole. And this takes a while. You want to just twist and twist and twist. Oops, just like that. So that you end up with a small hole like that. And then I'll go to the other side and I'll line it up so that it's matching with the hole on this side. Then I press and start drilling. And I like to drill from both sides because this prevents cracking. Because sometimes your bead can crack because it is under stress while you're drilling it. So I like to drill a bit from one side, like this. And then I like to go to the other side and drill from that side until I meet in the middle of the bead. And I would do this for every single one of my beads. And this is another reason why you want to wait until your resin is fully cured. Because by pressing on it with your fingers you can get finger marks. So you want to wait until your resin is fully cured. So it can take a little while. Almost there. Yep, there we are. There we are, and we're through. Now I'm using a rather thin drill bit, and when I have got a small guide hole like that, I like to go onto a thicker drill bit, like this, and then go through using my guide hole. And the reason I do it with the small drill first is because it's just easier to control and then you it makes using the bigger drill much easier there we are and the reason I don't do this before I bake my beads because although it works pretty well it will distort the shape of your bead and also it won't come out as tidy looking as that so you want to shake it out and you'll do that for all of your beads. We want to be doing it from the fat end. We don't want to really be doing it from the thin end. So I'll do that with the continue doing that with the rest of beads, and then we can come back and start stringing. Okay, so I finished drilling all of the beads. Now we are going to string them. So I've got a 16, about a 16 inch strand of AccuFlex, and I've got two jump rings, two crimps two charlotte crimps and a clasp so you're going to string your charlotte's crimp on don't let it go the whole way i like to just hold it between my fingers there then you'll grab one of your crimp beads and slide that up and you want to leave a slight tail then you want to bring over your pliers and squish that flat like that then bring that up and butter up against the crimp bead close it and squish it closed with your pliers. Then we'll grab one of our jump rings and open it up, string it through the charlotte crimp, pop one of our clasps, one of the pieces of our clasp on, and then close up the jump ring again. Just like that. So I'll put that aside for the moment and now we're going to string our beads. So, we have got six colours. Just bring them over. So these are the browns. And here are the purples. And now we need to decide how we are going to string them out. So, I think we're going to start with a brown. And they're going to be hanging like this, of course. So I'm going to design it and then I'll come back and show you. Okay, so that's how I'm going to have it. And I've decided there's no particular pattern other than it's brown, blue, brown, blue. 
but the pattern that I do have is that we have segments where I've used all three browns and then all three blues and then start over again all three browns and all three blues that's the pattern that I've chosen so we'll string these on whoops, one at a time onto our strand and because we made those holes nice and big they will string on really easily and they won't scrape against your strand or anything like that. If you make your hole too small you're going to have a little bit of trouble stringing it onto your um, stringing material and on top of it being a pain to string it also can cause wear on your stringing material which you don't want because it will break sooner and so you want to make sure that your holes in your beads aren't going to wear on your necklace and it also means that when you wear it it will slide around easily so you can reposition it and things like that so we're almost done just a few more so really when I'm doing my um, when I do polymer clay I like to I like to make sure that the stringing process is the shortest process of all and I like it like to keep it so making the polymer clay actually is the longest bit so now we need to attach our crimp so we'll string our charlotte crimp on then we string our crimp and again let it leave a little tail squish it with our pliers butter up squish it and then close it with our pliers then we bring over our jump ring open that up bring over our crimp or our charlotte crimp string that on then string on the other piece of our clasp and close it up again and that is the necklace all done like that so I'm just going to clear up the tile so that you can see exactly what it looks like so just hold on a second and there we are that is our project and so I'm just going to bring over the other one that I have that you might want to have a look at and here it is now this one was done practically the exact same way it's the same shapes and it's the same concept with the textures so you can see that we've got stamps and then we've got the cutters and then we've got one or two of the ones that I did by hand but this one's a little different because it was done with a more blue and green tone rather than a brown and purple tone but it was done the exact same way other than the colors just look different so if you're using Kata concentrates be sure to play around with them as you can mix up any color you want and this was done using Kata concentrates as well so you can see that the range of colors is just endless so play around with it and see what you can make and so i do hope that this tutorial was helpful to you and if it was please do visit my website jessimatutorials.com where you can send in pictures of what you've made using this technique and this tutorial and if you're watching this on my website jessimatutorials.com do check below the video as there'll be a form down there where you can send in pictures of what you've made. And as always, I hope to see you in the next video. Bye for now.